I'm Eric Chemi, and this is Politely Pushy. Sri, thanks for joining me on the podcast. You're doing amazing work at Rocket Lane, customer onboarding. You're working on so many different industries. And thank you especially for joining me from India. It's late for you. It's early for me. It's you're you're all over the world. So I appreciate you spending time with me today, Sri. It's nice to chat with you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on. So customer onboarding, help explain someone who maybe they don't think about this on a daily basis, right? Because most people, they're employees, they're not necessarily making these kinds of decisions to bring a company like you on. When you say customer onboarding, do you mean a customer, like a B2B customer, a B2C customer? Walk me through the, you know, the ecosystem here of, of who's buying Rocket Lane and for what customer they're trying to onboard. Sure. So Rocket Lane essentially is helping run customer facing projects better right and typically this means b2b customers where uh, let's take the example of a SaaS company a technology company that's offering a solution to another company uh, the customer decided to buy from the vendor but things don't end at the purchase right that's when the journey actually begins and it usually takes maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months to set up that customer for success with your product. And that's where this whole dance of the customer journey, customer onboarding journey happens, right? So you're sort of saying, hey, we have this playbook of how we're going to get you to value. All these steps need to be followed. You need to do some things. We need to do some things. And that's when we know that we can make you successful with our product. So that's the customer onboarding that we're talking about here. And right now, what are you seeing macroeconomic wise? Are you seeing a little bit of a pullback that we're seeing in the media headlines? Or are you seeing, are you seeing still a strength of, you know, of customers out there? Are you still seeing demand for products? Are you seeing companies right now saying we, we want to hold back expense right now? We're nervous about what 2023 looks like. There were a couple of months where there was some pullback because there's overall, I would say budget freezes, which are, which don't discriminate between product A and product B. Right? But then once uh, companies, including ourselves, figured out that, hey, this is about having a conversation with the CFO, uh, making a case or helping our champions have that conversation and make that case, then I think the you know story has turned around. Uh, and uh, you know, truly onboarding remains as important, if not more important than before, because every customer you bring in, you want to make sure that you get them to value. You want to make them a referenceable, happy customer. And uh, today in, in a climate where number of those customers is going to be limited, I guess it's even more important that you make sure you're turning those fewer customers that, that are coming in into advocates for your brand, for your solution. And uh, that's where we are able to help. And when you look at your competitor set right now, who are the companies that that you're most concerned about? Is it is it inaction by customers just to not do anything? Or is there a certain couple of big companies that you're saying, these are the guys that we need to displace? These are the people we need to knock out, make sure we have better product than them? Yeah, I think uh, you're fortunate to be in a space where it's easy for us to differentiate and show value versus the status quo. The status quo is usually... Yes, in smaller companies, it's nothing or spreadsheets that companies are using and they know that they need to put something in place. Otherwise, they don't look mature in front of the customers. They aren't able to hold customers accountable to take that journey with them. So lots of problems there. Uh, and when we go to larger customers, mid-market or enterprise, people are using regular project management tools. And well, those tools actually do a good job, but we're able to show companies how a purpose-built tool can be 5x better or 10x better depending on which product they're using today and and that really helps right so i think you know we we for larger customers end up displacing regular project management tools which are all which have been out there for a long time and uh, and yeah i think the the differentiation comes through easily in a demo this is your second time around as a company founder what lessons did you learn from the first run that, you know, maybe mistakes that you don't want to repeat again or, or regrets that you had, what are you doing differently now compared to the first time? I think 
very contrasting journey compared to our uh, first journey. Um, one in this one, we are we are backed by some big VCs. Last time we were bootstrapped for most part of our journey. Uh, but on the execution front, a few things that we have done differently. I think last time we thought we'll build a great product and people will find us, people will talk about us, and uh, traction will be sort of automatic. Uh, but this time we really focused on marketing what we built as well right? we've always had a good product dna on the team this time i think we've also done justice to the product by putting in the right amount of energy behind um, taking our product to market telling our story well uh, ensuring that you know we're, we're pitching value to customers they're understanding how to make a case internally for our product like they may love it from a demo but how do they make sure that they can take it to their management and convince folks to spend money on buying our tool. So a lot of learning. I think also our approach to sales has been not just understanding whether someone will buy or not, but one of active problem solving with the customer to figure out how to help them see the value, how to help them you know, go through that journey with us quickly uh, through the evaluation instead of us waiting on them. How do we be proactive in that sales journey as well? Uh, and and lastly, I would say one thing we did very differently this time is we didn't launch an MVP or minimum viable product. We sort of launched a full featured product at get-go. Uh, so again, one more thing we did very differently. Why? What was the reason for that? Right, Because that's a big decision a lot of companies go through is do we do the minimum viable product, figure it out as we go, get some traction, you decided to be more patient at this time. Why, why were you able to do that? Yeah, I think firstly, um, we have an advantage of uh, having built multiple SaaS products before. Uh, and, and that meant we sort of knew what a roadmap would be for the solution. Even if we were to launch something early, where will people take us? Uh, and we had this vision for an all-in-one unified solution, right? We weren't trying to build one more product that an implementation team or onboarding team would use. We wanted to be this one-stop solution for them, right? And that's where we felt, hey, if you're going to build all these pieces, then we don't want to go piecemeal to the customer and say, hey, now use like the project collaboration piece. Next month, we will be launching or next quarter, we'll be launching a document collaboration piece as well, etc. Instead, we, we said, hey, our first version of the product should already live up to that vision we have for it. And we can de-risk building it by, you know, taking mocks and, and early prototypes to customers and showing them, validating our thesis. But let's not launch one piece at a time because, A, it's harder to help the customer see that full vision of where we are going. And B, once you launch something, a customer is going to focus on iterations we give them on that front, right? So they will want more and more depth on the thing that we launched rather than the breadth that we wanted to show them they can accomplish with Rocket Lane. In between Rocket Lane, your previous company, it was acquired by Freshdesk, now known as Freshworks. So you were there for a while after the acquisition. And I assume that's where you were percolating new ideas, right? I assume that's where you're thinking about what's my next move going to be. You came up with the idea for Rocket Lane there. Tell us about that experience. How did that in-between time, going from founder back to, you know, acquired employee, back to founder, what did you learn in that middle phase that has helped you this time around? Freshworks is almost like a SaaS school for us. Uh, yeah. Spent four and a half years there. Uh, it's it's the first company, SaaS company from India to have uh, listed on the NASDAQ. So quite a generational company that has been built. We learned the go-to-market motions, how, you know, inside sales teams can be super productive and, and give you great leverage to sell to SMB. And that being a strength, that being a business model innovation of sorts is something we learned there as well. And for us really going in, it didn't feel like we've become like employees in a much larger corporate. Freshworks itself was still a startup when we went there, right? A larger startup than what we were, definitely. They were, you know, around, I think 300 
sorry, maybe 350, 400 people when we went and uh, we were a 10 member team. Uh, but still we were running our own product. We had enough freedom to do things our way and having that freedom and a hefty mandate with good support from the ARG was just what we needed at that time. How much do you have a leg up because your product is about customers? How much do you have a leg up working with your own customers, right? Because you, that's all you're thinking about, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit of a meta question, right? You're, you're so focused thinking about customers that do you have a leg up when you're making your sales, when you're dealing with your rocket lane customers, because the product itself is about customers. If, if that makes sense, you see where I'm going with this question. I think dog fooding is like something that, that, uh, is super important for, uh, at least for our team, we prefer that we build things that we will use and learn from our own usage as well. And that way, I think, you know, for every customer that we bring on, even if it's like a small five member team, we onboard them using Rocket Lane. So it helps us figure out ways to make our product scale better for small teams. It helps us understand different kinds of customers because with each of them, we are helping them set up their onboarding journey in Rocket Lane. We are learning from those experiences. Uh, we have a community uh, for, for people in this onboarding and implementation function. Our team also learns there, but uh, you know, it, it's for everyone to learn and share. So it's been fantastic to use our own tool. Incidentally, our tech team, marketing team, everyone uses Rocket Lane, not just we don't use it just for customer onboarding. For all of the projects, we use Rocket Lane. And that way, again, we, we have a lot of feedback coming in from the team. Uh, and, and of course, the engineers, if they experience a problem, uh, using our own product, we to go in and fix that. Sri, you hear the words customer experience, customer success. They're used a lot nowadays, especially the last couple of years. Some companies even have a chief customer experience officer, chief customer success officer. You think about this every day. What do those words mean to you, right? When you hear customer experience, customer success, what, what does that mean to you? Right. I think, you know, my mind automatically goes to like the org chart and what these teams typically I've known to be responsible for. I think customer experience is pretty broad, sometimes falls under marketing, sometimes is, is you know, includes customer support and uh, surveying and touch points of all kinds. Uh, to me, customer experience is really about, you know, every touch point that someone experiences with your brand, uh, right from even before someone becomes a customer, right? Even a prospect engaging with your brand, uh, how do they uh, experience working with you, dealing with your brand? So from a sales cycle to contracting to, hey, we just closed, what happens now? to if a you know onboarding a customer of course uh, but even beyond uh, you know how, how are you helping them get to value uh, what happens if the customer is stuck somewhere or confused or reaches out to you needs your support help what happens during renewal everything is part of customer uh, experience right and uh, even the way you deliver let's say uh, learning for the customer to get value from your solution the way you uh, talk to them about new features you're launching to them. All of that is part of customer experience versus customer success. This is more about how are you helping the customer get to value? How are you helping them uh, realize the potential of your solution? How are you helping them with adoption? How are you helping them with getting set up the right way? Uh, how are you helping them utilize all of the capabilities that you've built? How are you understanding their goals and aligning what they need to do in your product with them reaching their goals? That's what customer success is all about. You've got a few big verticals that you focus on. I mean, you're, you're in a lot of areas, but there's a few that I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about. One of them, supply chain. What, what are you seeing right there? Because we've heard so many stories about the supply chain's a mess ever since COVID, labor shortages, material shortages, transportation bottlenecks. Supply chain is a problem and a real one. What's your perspective on it? What are companies doing right? What are they doing wrong? How are you helping them get through this? Yeah, you know, it is one of the big verticals that 
we've seen a lot of adoption for our solution from. It's not like we went after that though. It's so happened that we see a lot of traction there. And I believe this is because, uh, you know, supply chain is an area where there is a lot of digital investment still happening, right? Because uh, you do want to move away from more manual work uh, digital transformation projects are happening all the time in, in enterprise. Uh, COVID accelerated that, as we all know. And even beyond that now, I think companies have realized the potential of choosing to use more digital solutions for various problems around supply chain, logistics, etc. And so uh, they are buying more software and we are working with those software vendors to ensure that their software gets implemented in a timely manner because this space is notorious for very long drawn projects, multiple stakeholders across different teams on the customer side needing to be involved. You know, integrations are, are could be really messy, right? Lots of systems that you need to integrate with. All of it makes it pretty complex. And, and that's where I think we are able to streamline things, showcase the journey the right way, give the right visibility to partners, internal teams, customers to ensure that project execution is on track. Another area you're focused on is conversational AI. And that's been a hot topic these last couple of weeks, chat GPT, opening all of that. That's not the same as what businesses are using, right? That's a lot of media buzz. What's the reality? What's the business use case for conversational AI? How are you involved in that? And you know, when they're doing customer onboarding, this could go wrong really quickly, right? If this is not, if this doesn't work well, you can have some real problems and and very public facing problems. So, talk about your experience there. Right. So, I think uh, teams that are building conversational AI have been seeing some good tailwinds over the last few years, right? Uh, it has been a hot topic, as you said. I think GPT, uh, chat GPT will, will help uh, sort of all of these companies leapfrog in terms of the kind of solutions they're able to offer. Uh, but at the same time, the crux of this is, again, it comes down to providing a familiar experience for customers, which you know chat definitely is. Uh, and for various kinds of use cases, right? A uh, you know, customer trying to reach out to a brand to get some work done to tackle a problem. And people don't want to throw more people at the problem and say, hey, human agents are going to respond to everything. You want to deflect most of those conversations, handle it automatically, but you want to do it in a medium that is, is familiar and friendly for a customer. That's where I think these chatbots and conversation AI have been winning. Uh, and this doesn't apply just to external customers, but even for like internal IT teams, uh, which, which want to work with their employees uh, and offer solutions or offer help. That's also moving to chat based conversations and, and conversation AI kicking in. Right. So that's, that's where we've seen uh, a lot of traction happen. And setting up these systems is not easy. Again, there is training needed. There is ML and AI coming into the picture. There is configurations of the right flows, picking what needs to be implemented first. And so there are teams, entire parts of teams that work with the customer to set up these chatbots the right way. And these projects, when, when you need to collaborate between the vendor, the, the chatbot vendor and their customer, they need to be on track for the customer to build confidence that, hey, this is the vendor I want to continue working with and innovate on further. And that's where I think Rocket Lane helps build that confidence in the execution for the partnership. What about FinTech? Right? We're seeing so many stories now about Wells Fargo had to pay a big fine because of bad practices, right? Like that, that was a failure of technology and processes. We're seeing FTX, another failure of humans in technology and processes. So FinTech is a real risky area. You're doing a lot in that space. What's your perspective there? Luckily for us, I, I would say our involvement in the area is, is more to help the fintech company uh, sort of implement their software the right way, not really in delivering a fintech solution, right? Uh, rather in, in project management, that, uh, managing that delivery. And uh, uh, 
definitely i think again multiple stakeholders data that needs to be uh you know set up the right way for for these tools to uh deliver value uh integration with multiple systems developers being involved and we all know developers uh prefer to do things their way uh at their pace uh so so what we are able to see as as helping in these scenarios is really create a professional experience around getting the customer to that end point where they want to go right so you know what their goals are you're going to set up the right plan for them and help them see the full picture saying hey here's how you can get to value in 6 weeks with our product and here's what you need to do to get there so set them on that right path uh, set them on a path based on the pace they want to go at and uh, hold people accountable from there right hey developer you said you will do this integration by next week are you able to deliver it if not there's going to be a email that goes out automatically to everyone involved saying here's what's happening so hold people accountable get to value on time where are we going to see you and rocket lane a year from now where like how how much growth are you expecting what do you see the the world the macro world the micro world when we're sitting down at the end of 2023 what's the space just the general customer onboarding space and the rocket lane role within there right i think this this is still a new space it's a new category it's growing fast uh i believe it will continue to grow fast in 2023 because we're still at a small base right it, there's there's only upwards movement movement from here possible and uh, so we are bullish about the category we are doing the first ever conference uh, which we did this year this the second event of uh, propel happens in 2023 the first one happened in 2022 and this is the first ever conference for folks in customer onboarding implementation etc uh, we are seeing a lot more you know teams getting formalized behind this function so this function itself is is breaking out in different companies they're separating it from customer success into its own thing evolving it into a professional services organization within the company very often so that's exciting as well for us and what we really want to focus on is how do we in a year from now start looking like the default option for any company that wants to execute on cross company projects right onboarding is one kind of customer facing project but we want to go beyond that as well uh, if if you're a marketing agency that wants to work with a customer rocket lanes for you as well right if you are a consulting company rocket lanes for you as well anyone who wants to run an initiative or a project with a different organization we want to be the default for that and online you've got a maturity model walk us through the insights that 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 offers so can anybody use it what's the the benefit here and tell people how they can explore it yeah so if you just go to maturitymodel.rocketlane.com there's like this quiz that you can take and what we're really trying to understand is where are you on the maturity curve with respect to delivering on your customer onboarding projects right so think about it there's various dimensions where you could be doing well or not so well with respect to customer facing project delivery and we've really tried to use this quiz as a mechanism to open people's eyes to where they're doing well and where they're not because very often we don't even know what are those different dimensions we start improving on one front and that's what we know and we keep trying to make more adjustments on that same dimension while reality is everything has its its sort of you know effort versus reward ratio right if you are doing really badly on a dimension of course making an improvement there is going to help you see big rewards for that but if you're already doing great if you're at a 5 on 10 uh, or let's say if you're on a 8 on 10 getting to 10 on 10 might not help you all that much and that's why we are introducing these dimensions saying hey value delivery value orientation how much is your process focused on delivering value to the customer next what's the experience that you're delivering through that project uh, so customer experience is something we want to help you focus on as well uh then there is this whole aspect of are are you set up to adapt to the customers changing needs 
and is your organization mature right so do you, do you have people uh, who are you know focused only on this problem do you have methodologies that are adaptive in nature which adjust to the customer's maturity today and lastly are you measuring things right are you are you looking at metrics or are you just doing the work uh, because only when you measure you know where you're doing well where you're not and you're able to improve and how is your automation posture right so are you doing a lot of automation or is there a lot of manual work happening today those are some dimensions that we identified and said hey let's start evaluating where you stand on these few dimensions that that uh, we're going to open your eyes to Sri, this has been a really great conversation. I appreciate the time today. Thank you for walking me through your experience and what Rocket Lane has to offer. Thank you so much for having me on, Eric. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.